years and early 1960s, steam was enjoying its Indian summer as the much-loved Stevenson locomotive gave way throughout the world to the alien diesel and electric locomotives. In Great Britain, interest in railways was on the increase, and the then novel BBC television was persuaded that there was an audience for pure railway films, and so Railway Roundabout was born. For five years, from 1958 to 1962, Patrick Whitehouse and John Adams filmed, edited and produced films about all aspects of railways, presenting 10 25-minute shows a year at 5.30 in the afternoon, ostensibly for children, but in time for many adults to tune in. The films themselves were carefully retained and are now part of our national heritage, being held in the care of the National Railway Museum at York. The programmes which form this series of five have been prepared from those original films, so we can all once again relive the great days of the Railway Roundabout. In 1960, the Railway Roundabout cameras were focused on one of British Railway's most anachronistic branch lines, that from Axminster and East Devon to Lyme Regis. Axminster was on the main line from Waterloo to Salisbury and Exeter, and main line southern trains called at the station to make connections for the coastal branch. Famous trains such as the Atlantic Coast Express called here, and even detached through coaches for the Lime branch. The branch was anachronistic because it sported a trio of locomotives that were amongst the oldest working engines in Great Britain, the Adams Radial Tanks. These three engines were celebrities in the early 1960s because, despite modernization of many rural branches with diesel multiple units, they defied all attempts to break their monopoly of the Lime Regis branch. As number 30583, the middle one of the trio, runs round its train, another express from Waterloo calls at the station. As with the up train seen earlier, this is headed by one of the southern region's rebuilt Merchant Navy class Pacific's Cunard White Star, which had been rebuilt two years earlier. Its original outline is illustrated by the next up train arriving behind a West Country Pacific. Radio's monopoly of the Lime Regis branch had come about because of the flexibility of their wheelbase. They were 442 tanks with a longer than usual throw on the leading and trailing wheels. They were also very light engines spreading their weight over five axles rather than the three common to most light tank engines. The locomotive seen here had a curious history. Built in 1885 as one of a class of 71 locomotives, for use on the London suburban services of the London and South Western Railway. It was sold as surplus to requirements during the First World War and was later bought by the East Kent Railway, an impecunious concern that was part of the Colonel Stevens Light Railway Empire. It was laid aside there just before the Second World War. Meanwhile, all but two of the remainder of the class had been sold or scrapped by the beginning of 1928, these two being retained for use on the Lime Regis branch. They survived all attempts to replace them, but after the Second World War, both needed heavy repairs. This emphasized the lack of any emergency cover, and as the East Kent engine still survived in a derelict condition, it was purchased by the Southern and refurbished, becoming British Railways number 30583. And so it was that Pat Whitehouse and John Adams came to film this extraordinary locomotive kept in magnificent condition after a recent overhaul. The Lime Regis branch swept over the main line on a flyover and headed for the coast. It had been built at the turn of the century and opened in 1903. Built under the provisions of a light railway order, it had severe curves and gradients. It twisted and turned to take advantage of the lie of the land, and this is what accounted for the survival of the Adams tanks. There was one intermediate station, a halt at Compine, which boasted a camping coach. All around the station site can be seen evidence of civil engineers' work as the summer of 1960 saw extensive track renewals on the branch. Although few people realized it, this was the Adams tank's ultimate dump. At the end of the summer, an Ivert tank was tried on the branch and proved satisfactory. By July 1961, all the Adams engines were withdrawn. Beyond Compine, the line continued to twist and turn, and then crossed a valley on the ten-arch Cannington Viaduct, 
built of concrete in 1900. One arch of this had quickly required reinforcement by a jack arch, which ruined its appearance, but the structure survives today. Concrete was used extensively by the London and South Western Railway, and concrete supports were used for a slippery cutting side, as well as concrete station name boards, platform edgings, plate layers huts, lamp standards, amongst many other things. These were manufactured at the railway's plant at Exeter. As the train arrives at Lyme Regis, it can be seen that the single coach which forms the train bears the number 108 on the end. This was its set number. The southern region and its forebears kept its carriages in fixed formation rates of up to 10 coaches and allocated them to specific services. These were given set numbers, and this system even applied to single coaches where the requirements of the service only required one coach. Despite its use of push-pull services on many branches, the Southern never fitted the Lime Regis engines with the equipment, and all trains ran round. On summer Saturdays, through trains ran from Waterloo, requiring two of the Adams tanks double-heading. Number 30583's tenacity continued after withdrawal, and she still works today on the Bluebell Railway. The summer of 1960 proved to be an Indian summer for many of the ancient locomotives of the southern region. Like the warriors of old, the Drummond class T9440s had retired to the west to make their last stand, and Pat Whitehouse visited the western slopes of Dartmoor to record their last days. At this time, 13 out of the original 66 members of the class were still in traffic, but all had gone by the end of 1961. Number 30715 was to last another 14 months until July 1961. However, at Whitson in 1960, the 1899 built locomotive was still at work on the Plymouth to Exeter and Padstow and Bude lines to Oakhampton and still had plenty of life in her. Sister engine 30718 was recorded at 78 miles an hour during the summer, recalling the great days of the turn of the century when this particular batch of engines was known as Dubs Express as they were built by the Glasgow Engineering Company and used on the LSWR's top link express trains. Number 30715 sports two white discs on her smoke box. These indicate a Waterloo or Exeter to Plymouth for return working. The discs were the Southern's train describer system and could be fixed in any of six different positions on the lamp brackets. Most other railways used a standard British headlamp code and the Southern used lamps at night but in the same position as the discs. These told the signalman on what route the train was working. This particular train was the Plymouth portion of the famous Atlantic Coast Express, which was to combine with further portions from Padstow and Bude at Oakhampton, the hub of the southern system east of Exeter. This system was known rather cruelly as the Withered Arm, due to its appearance on maps. With a large number of destinations served by long single-line branches, the Southern employed a system of multi-destination trains with through coaches, so that even the smallest Cornish resorts could boast of direct trains to London Waterloo. A second T9, also allocated to Oakhampton, draws number 30715's train out of the station, in the direction it's come from, into the up sidings with passengers still aboard. leaves the platform clear for the Padstow train, indicated by discs on either side of the smoke box, to run in, behind a bullied light Pacific locomotive. The Plymouth coaches are added at the back. The Atlantic Coast Express ran daily throughout the year and was famous for being the most multi-portioned train in the country. The Southern had built special coaches for these through trains, so that a two or even one coach train sported first and second class accommodation. T9s were ideally suited to the long branches, as although they were large wheeled, they had a good water capacity 
and were able to gallop along between the country stations with their light loads. They were designed by the redoubtable Dougal Drummond, who came from Scotland to the LSWR and perpetuated and improved his designs from that country. There was a distinctly Scottish look about his locomotives, although the T9's appearance was dramatically altered in the 1920s when they were superheated with the addition of an extended smoke box and stovepipe chimney. The British Railway's secondary locomotive line black livery suited them very well, and O'Campton Shed kept its engines in very clean condition. The 30715 had not been repainted for at least four years, as it still sported the pre-1957 British Railways totem, unlike 30313, which had the later one. The two engines on shed here show the two principal variations seen on the class, tenders and splashes. 313 has wide splashes and a six-wheel tender, while 715 has the eight-wheeled inside-bearing watercart tender and a narrow cab and splashes. On the cab side can be seen the designation 3P above the number. This was British Railway's power classification and indicates a locomotive of grade 3 suitable for passenger work. An F indicated a freight engine and MT mixed traffic. The power grade ran from 0 to 9, the latter the most powerful. Number 30715 is next seen backing onto coaching set number 26, which has been dropped off from a down express. She used to take this to Padstow, as indicated by the discs. In the opposite direction, number 30338 is seen heading for Exeter with a local train. This engine has the wide splashes, indicative of one of the later built engines, and water cart tender. Strictly speaking, the T9 classification only applied to the wide splasher engines but it later referred to all the engines, which had a far less prosaic nickname, Greyhounds, as they were regarded as very speedy engines in their youth. A final view from the footplate takes us on to the withered arm at Launceston, where we see 30338 once again. One example of this much-loved class was preserved as LSWR and Southern Railway Number 120, and she belongs to the National Railway Museum at York although she resided on the Swanage Railway in Dorset at the beginning of the 1990s, still in operating condition. was one of the founder members of the Talaflin Railway Preservation Society, which organized rail tours to the railway for its AGM each year. Interesting motive power was guaranteed, and in 1960, a pair of the Great Western's Duke Dog 440s did the honors. The railway roundabout cameras were, naturally enough, on hand to record the train and the preparation of the locomotives at Shrewsbury's Great Western Shed. These were the last double-frame locomotives on British railways, a relic of the Victorian era, although these engines were officially built as late as 1936. Double-frame construction was common on the Great Western Railway in the 19th century, partly as a result of the need to produce convertible locomotives as the era of the broad gauge came to an end. Double-frame locomotives came to symbolize the Dean era, and the engines produced were among Britain's most elegant. The general purpose version of Dean's design was a modestly dimensioned 440, which formed the Duke of Cornwall class. A transitional design was produced by Churchward with a modern tapered boiler on the original chassis, known as the Bulldog class. Both types had become obsolete by the 1930s, but some examples survived for use on lightly laid lines such as the Cambrian routes. The older Dukes were lighter in weight, but their chassis were wearing out whilst the heavier bulldogs were precluded from some lines because of their weight. In the cash-starved 30s, a new design could not make economic sense, so a classic compromise was made, with the lighter Duke boilers being put on the more robust bulldog chassis. 
The resultant engines earned the nickname Duke Dogs and survived internationalization. The Tullyflin special train used two of the last three surviving engines. Both were withdrawn later in the year. Another narrow-gauge railway made a junction with the Cambrian main line where the train paused at Welshpool. The line was the Welshpool and Clanfair light railway, which is also preserved. The Cambrian main line is single for a large part of its length, and this train illustrates the method used for picking up the train token on the move. The signalman places it in the bracket attached to a large loop. Note how it's picked up by the second engine. It has to be the last engine in the section which carries the tablet. This could be a painful operation if the crew got it wrong. The Lurpik is at the top of a severe climb from both directions on the watershed of the Cambrian Mountains. Here the special was held in the loop to allow the passage of the premier train on the route, the Cambrian Coast Express. This was double-headed by the Duke Dog's effective replacements, British Railway Standard Class 4, 460s. This station epitomizes the common practice of railways which avoided towns by naming stations with the word road added to the town's name. If you went to a road station, you knew you still had some way to go to get to the town. Here the train paused and the late Oliver Velton, divisional superintendent at Shrewsbury, spoke to the crew. He was responsible for the Vale of Rydal's survival in BR hands. He had been a good friend to the preservationists, ensuring they had the special locomotives on the AGM trains. Both Pat and John beat the train to its destination and filmed its arrival. The train had run during the afternoon as the AGM was held in the evening, starting at 7 p.m. There were other things to see before the AGM, and a special train ran on the Talaflin for members. The engine was number four, Edward Thomas, recently fitted with a diesel ejector and chimney, which ruined its appearance. Pat joined the footplate crew on the second Duke Dog as they took the empty stock forward to Barmouth. The railway roundabout team had built a special bracket to hold the cameras, which could be bolted to the cab side. The Cambrian main line followed the coast between Towin and Fairbourne, climbing quite severely near Fiog. Here the line was carved into the mountainside and an avalanche shelter was provided at the summit. on the footplate, John had gone by road to the end of the sand spit opposite Barmouth and its famous bridge. It was this bridge built entirely of timber which enforced the weight restrictions on the Cambrian main line. In later years it was attacked by marine termites and was nearly lost, but it stands to this day.
Yarmouth, the engines were separated for watering. The coaches were to remain here for servicing, but there were no other facilities for the locomotives, which had to return to McCuncliffe for this purpose. They ran tender first back to Barmouth Junction, so they could turn on the triangle there to run smokebox first for the rest of the journey. The return train left Towin at 11pm and included sleepers in its formation. Note the single lamp on the centre of the buffer beam, donating light engines. Cosmopolitan, the roundabout team moved from Wales to Scotland to record yet more pre-grouping 440s at work. The purpose was to film a pair of Pickersgill 440s of the Caledonian Railway on the Highland Main Line. The locomotives were prepared at Perth Shed and that gave John Adams, travelling up the day before Pat Whitehouse, the opportunity to visit the shed and film the locomotives which it housed from diesel to steam. Stanier's Black Fives were the mainstay of the ex-LMS railways in Scotland, having largely supplanted the various types of pre-grouping 440s, such as those which were to be filmed. The ubiquitous Fives covered most duties in Scotland. As an ex-Caledonian railway shed, Perth boasted many of that railway's locomotives, including its original number 457, a Pickersgill Class 2P044 tank. Also to be seen were LNER locomotives, this one being a North British Class J37. These were 5-foot driving wheeled 060s, the largest and final design of freight engine for the North British. 104 were built between 1914 and 1921. The J37 makes an interesting contrast to the Midlands contemporary Class 4F, which was perpetuated as an early LMS standard class. 44253 is one of the latter engines and is fitted with a tender cab to make it more suitable for work in the Scottish winters. The LNER's equivalent to the Black Five was the Thompson B1460. A few of these mixed traffic engines bore names mostly with an antelope theme, but this example was an exception. They were probably the unloved designer's best work and bore the same classification 5MT as the Black Fives. The B1s were Thompson's equivalent to his predecessor's Class V2 262s. The B1s had two outside cylinders and were deliberately as simple as possible mechanically. Wesley's V2 sported his three-cylinder layout with the inside cylinder's valve gear actuated by means of conjugated linkage from the outside gear. This was expensive in maintenance terms, but the V2s were built like a watch. This V2 was painted in British Railway's Line Green Express passenger livery, although it was classified as a mixed traffic engine. A very special Gresley Jewel was the K4 Class 260. Just six of these moderately dimensioned three-cylinder moguls were built to work on the West Highland line. Thompson rebuilt one of them as a two-cylinder machine as the prototype for his standard K1 class. They actually had a higher power rating, 6MT, than the 460B1 class. Belonging more to the Thompson School of Thought is this LMS mogul. It's a class 4 built after the war with features such as two outside cylinders and a high running board to make everything get out of war. The class rejoiced in the nickname Flying Pigs. More Caledonian locomotives were to be seen. This 060 had been disfigured with a stovepipe chimney. The original elegant design was still worn by the standard McIntosh shunting tank which passes it. 30 out of 47 built between 1905 and 1922 still survived at the end of 1960. All were gone by the end of 1963. 
The majority of the Caledonian locomotives to be seen were of Macintosh's design. Pickersgill's 440s were the main reason for the visit of the cameras, but this engine was not one of the participants. She was still in everyday unkempt condition. Note the Westinghouse air pump alongside the boiler. The Caledonian was unusual in British practice in its use of the air braking system, although today all trains utilize air brakes rather than vacuum. These were the stars. Two of the Pickersgill 440s had been pulled up in the great Scottish tradition and looked superb. The film of the two 440s, known as Cali Bogies, commenced where the last film finished. The second of the two engines was 54486, which had had a more recent coat of paint than her sister, as she bore the post-1957 British Railways totem on her tender. This totem was the subject of some acrimony between British Railways and the College of Heraldry. Apparently, only a left-facing lion had been submitted to and approved by the College. British Railways produced both left and right-hand versions, to ensure the lion always faced forward. As only a left-facing one had been granted, the right-hand one was illegal, and thereafter the lion on the right of the engine looked back from whence he had come. The 440s made a number of extra movements for the camera. The use of these engines had been specially arranged for this program, once again demonstrating the excellent working arrangements that the railway roundabout team enjoyed with British Railways by this time. The locomotives were members of a class of 48 machines which had been produced under the superintendency of William Pickersgill between 1916 and 1922. They were effectively the Caledonian Railway's final express passenger design and were the descendants of a famous line of classic Scottish 440s which had commenced during the reign of Dougal Drummond from 1882 to 1890. Drummond, who was responsible for the T9s, which we saw at the beginning of this program, introduced the inside cylindered 440 layout on both the North British and Caledonian railways. His successors on the latter, notably Lambie and McIntosh, developed the design gradually over a period of years. Progressive enlargements became known as the Dunalisters, the engines all being named. McIntosh's final version was the Dunalister 4 series, and these were updated during Pickersgill's regime, becoming the basis of the design of the new engines, which were unofficially dubbed Dunalister 5s. These were very successful engines, and the class survived intact until 1953, when number 54481 was scrapped after an accident, the remainder disappearing between 1959 and 1962. locomotives reversed down onto a train in Perth station. This was not, however, the train which was to be filmed. That was the overnight mails and sleeper which ran nightly from Euston to Inverness, arriving at Perth in the early hours, which would have made filming impracticable. Therefore, a dummy run was arranged for the previous day, and this is what we see here with the locomotives making a number of false starts for the cameras. came up to Scotland the following day. Both Pat and John had full-time jobs, with Railway Roundabout taking up a lot of their spare time. The official trip was first filmed at Blair Athol as the light became sufficient. This station stood at the foot of the long climb through the Grampian Mountains, which was always known to the Highland men as the Hill. Blair Athol shed housed a number of locomotives for banking use. 
Her radio program was also produced under the title of Railway Roundup. The sound recorders for this was Eric Russell, who seemed climbing aboard the second engine with his cumbersome equipment. With John Adams at the line side, Pat riding on the pilot engine, and Eric on the train engine, the show was on the road. the vintage mail coach behind the standard BR Gov or general utility van. John Adams was able to get ahead of the train in a number of different places as he was driven by a legendary Scottish cameraman Bill W.J.V. Anderson who knew the line intimately. climb from Blair to the summit at Dramochta included seven miles at one in 70. The train then ran downhill to Aviemore, where the final views were filmed. The train ran on to Inverness via Slocht Summit on the new direct route and the engines were to return to Perth later in the day with a train on the old Highland route via Darva which joined the new route at Aviemore. Today part of that old route forms the Strathspey Railway. Another line joined the Darva line at Boat of Garten. This was the Great North of Scotland Railway's Spey River or Spey Side Line, which started at Craigalachie, a small town in the heart of Scotch whisky producing country. The Scottish region had made arrangements for the day following the Perth to Aviemore trip for the preserved 440 Gordon Highlander to work on this line. Accordingly, the entourage moved on to Craigalachie to find the veteran locomotive being bulled up for her stardom. As she pulls away, a footbridge can be seen in the background. This crossed the main GNOS line from Elgin to Keith, with which the Spey River line connected. The line was single track throughout and was the Great North's furthest push to the west. The locomotive, GNOS number 49, was an example of that railway's final passenger locomotive design. It had been built in 1920 by the North British Locomotive Company in Glasgow and the design was the final development of a string of 440s for the GNOS. Classified as Class F by the Great North and D40 by the LNER and British Railways, she'd been withdrawn for preservation in 1958, at first returning to normal duties on the Spey River line in her restored condition. The eight members of her class and 13 Class V engines converted to the same specifications had been familiar on this line since the 1930s. the eight class F engines bore names. Inevitably, the military significance of Gordon Highlander's name gave rise to a nickname, the Soldier. Her restored livery is in fact historically incorrect. By the time she was built, black was the company's livery. She wasn't restored to original condition remaining as she'd been taken out of service. It was a regular service train, only the livery of the engine was unusual. Eric Russell again rode on the footplate for railway roundup. The Spey River line joined the original Highland Railway main line outside Boat of Garden Station. The two single lines ran parallel to one another for the last couple of miles, giving rise to a number of the inevitable races. Boat Station was joint. Today it's the northern terminus of the Strathspey Railway but that organization is hoping to extend its running line back to the north to Grantonon Spain. Perhaps one day Gordon Highlander will again be seen at Boat of Garth.
returning from Scotland via the east coast, another pre-grouping livery was encountered at Newcastle upon Tyne. Here, the station pilot, still in everyday BR service, had been repainted into Northeastern Railway Green, sporting both Northeastern and BR crests. The locomotive was one of a very ordinary type of 060 tank engine, but one which had an extraordinary history. The traditional Wurzel outline of this little engine shows that it was a Victorian design, 20 of them having been produced in 1898 and 1899 as NER Class E1. However, another 20 were built in 1914, and a further repeat order was completed in 1920. After the Northeastern had been incorporated into the London and Northeastern Railway in 1923, the locomotives became Class J72, and 10 more were built in 1925. However, the most extraordinary happening took place after nationalisation, as no less than 28 were built by British Railways, when the earliest members of the class were over 50 years old. This was also a British Railways built locomotive, only eight years after the last J72. At this time, the English electric Type 4 diesels, later to become Class 40, were beginning to take over on mainline duties. In 1960, the East Coast still looked like the traditional railway. LNER Pacifics, this one two years older than the last J72 and named after its designer, still ruled the roost despite the diesels. The Deltics were about to change all that, and a slaughter of these magnificent machines would follow. Already the older designs were disappearing fast, and this was the last J21, a reason for filming at Newcastle. She'd been specially clean for the cameras, but was on normal duties shunting about around the station area. Originally, there were 201 engines of this class, many built as compounds, but later converted to simples, constructed between 1886 and 1894. This engine survived a while longer and has been preserved, albeit only by the skin of its teeth. It was withdrawn in 1939, but reinstated because of the war. On its second withdrawal, BR set it aside for preservation, but later rescinded the decision and sold it for scrap. However, before it could be cut up, it was purchased privately and now resides a few miles from Newcastle at Beamish Museum in County Durham. These shots were taken at Manors, just to the north of Newcastle Station, by John Adams. The pictures at Newcastle were taken by Pat Whitehouse. One of Thompson's rather ungainly Pacifics of Class A2-3 is next, named Watling Street and is assisted in the rear by a second J-72 pilot. The third J-72 is seen shunting the stock of the travelling post office, or TPO, mail train. This is one of the original 1899 engines. Both the others were built in 1922. Grizzly engines follow, a J-39 and an A-3 Pacific. This is Columbo, still showing the diesels how to do it. Tyneside Electrics. The Northeastern was amongst the most progressive railways of its time and introduced electric services on its North Tyneside suburban services using third rail DC electrification. The units were articulated, the two coaches showing a common centre bogey. Today these services are part of the Tyne and Weir metro system. This is one of the long-lasting Northeastern class J27s, one of which is preserved. Also preserved is one of the J72s, resplendent in the livery of this pilot, but actually one of the BR-built examples. The East Coast theme is continued with a visit to York Station, where the loco spotters were awaiting one of the classic East Coast streaks, or Gresley Class A4 Pacific's Wild Swan on the non-stop Elizabethan. The more famous Flying Scotsman train had golden fleece at the head. Both were top shed engines. Another J-72 acted as pilot, an original 1898 example. In 1960, the York Railway Museum was a very small affair, which had been set up by the LNER. 
It was something of a contrast to the magnificent National Railway Museum of today, which was to take over its function. All the locomotives on display in the old museum were passed on to the care of the NRM, which is now the largest railway museum in the world. The NRM is the custodian of our rich railway history, with all kinds of artifacts from the locomotives themselves, through carriages, wagons, signalling, uniforms, tea urns, spoons, posters, timetables, engineers' drawings, books, and, of course, the original railway roundabout films from which these video programs have been prepared. The first locomotive of this class, Wesley's V2 Green Arrow 262, is one of the NRM's major exhibits, as is the last of the type which follows, the British Railway's Class 9F 210s. The Scarborough services had already been dieselized using the standard British Railway's diesel multiple units, but the cameras were here to film steam. Various East Coast Pacifics were filmed, starting with one of the successful Peppercorn A1's, Marmion. The spotters were probably looking for namers, but next saw this K1 going to Scarborough. The highlight was undoubtedly Thane of Fife, Thompson's ungainly rebuild of Grosley's celebrated P2 Mikado. Airborne follows a genuine Thompson Pacific. Note the odd positioning of the cylinders. It's not surprising these engines slipped as much as they did. The station pilot appears again. York also acquired a green Northeastern J72 in 1960. Our final view here is Herringbone, heading north past the locomotive depot that was to become the National Railway Museum. On the Midland Railway's main line from Derby to Manchester through the Peak District, there was a junction and exchange sidings with a most unusual railway, whose workings hark back to the earliest days of the railways. The railway was the Cromford and High Peak Railway, which ran up the side of the hills in the southern Peak District near Matlock, Derbyshire. It was one of the earliest railways of all, being authorised in 1825 and opened in 1831, predating the main line here by 18 years. Its purpose was to link two canals and provide a through route for freight between the capital of the Lancashire cotton industry, Manchester, and the East Midlands. The canals were the Cromford Canal in Derbyshire and the Peak Forest Canal at Whaley Bridge to the southeast of Manchester. The railway was built in a similar way to a canal, with steep inclines replacing locks, the inclines being joined by railways on the level. Right up to closure, as a through route in 1963, the railway was a curiosity to enthusiasts, as the two major inclines of Cheap Pasture and Middleton were rope work to the end, a practice which had been eliminated in most other parts of the country. The CNHP was a magnet to the railway roundabout team, who arranged to film its workings at a particularly interesting time. Austerity tanks ruled on the ground floor level between the transfer sidings and the foot of sheep pasture incline. Here wagons were hitched to the tow rope to ascend the one in nine climb. Empty wagons went up and loaded ones came down as the railway's function was now to move limestone from the quarries at the top of the hills. The semaphore signal had given the shunter at the top the authority to knock the chocks away, and the loaded wagons began to descend. At the bottom, the empties began to ascend. Note the worn pulley wheel, much of the equipment was still the original Victorian machinery. John Adams in a green jumper remained at the bottom whilst Pat Whitehouse rode in the ascending wagon. The railway rose approximately a thousand feet through its use of inclines, which were in constant use all day. In the early days of railways, stationary engines were considered a normal method of locomotion, but there were certain dangers. After two wagons ran away in 1888, shot off the tracks at the bottom, over the canal and Midland main line before being smashed to pieces in a field, a catch pit was installed on the incline. It was double tracked throughout and ran for approximately a mile. Naturally, the wagons arrived at the top and bottom simultaneously, the full wagons at the bottom being drawn away by the austerity tank. At the 
top, another remarkable tank engine type picked up the empty wagons. This 040 tank was built by British Railways in 1953 to an LMS design of 1932. It worked the short section between the top of sheep pasture and the bottom of Middleton inclines. The railway had maintained its independence until 1887, when the London and North Western Railway acquired it. This had little effect on its operations at the western end. The second incline was at Middleton, where the 040 tank pushed the wagons to the foot of the climb for attachment to the cable, which would have taxed the ingenuity of any scout. Once again, a signal was given to the man at the top to release the downcoming wagons, which in this instance were a pair of former London and Northwestern Railway locomotive tenders descending empty. There were no water facilities on the line, so all water supplies had to be lifted up to the top in these old tenders. The railway also supplied water in this way to factories and quarries and cottages on the uplands. Activity between Middleton Top and the main part of the railway was perhaps the most famous part of the Cromford and High Peak Railway. Here the London and North Western had imported some small 060 tanks from another of its absorbed lines, the North London Railway. In 1960 these engines were replaced by further austerities and the survival of this one engine was all that was needed to bring the cameras here in that year. These engines had worked the line since the 1930s and the sight of a pair of them rushing hot and inclined was one to behold. This was the last chance to film it. Hot and incline had originally been a rope-worked incline like Sheep Pasture and Middleton, but it had been eased out to allow conventional working in 1877. With a maximum gradient of 1 in 14, this was the steepest addition work railway in the country. wasn't unknown. Two wagons were virtually the limit for a single engine. Note in the background an austerity, waiting to take the train on along the top. Water was precious here, none was wasted. The North London tank went back and was soon to be withdrawn. But that wasn't the end for it. It was preserved. 